All right, guys, we're back with another uh, Processing Blue. We got the man Mike K with us. Mike, how are you, sir? Tired, but I'm really happy to be here. It's been a it's the, been a long time. Does food taste better after a win for the reporters who cover the team during that week? Does it is everything just a little better? I I wish I could tell you yes, but unfortunately, I missed out on the post game food and didn't eat and just went straight to sleep when I got home. So. <laughs> Uh, days and months are kind of glaring into each other with this new baby here. So, um, no, no, life changes, life changes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've been through it once, but life definitely does change. <clears throat> um, trade deadline this week, Mike. The Panthers did nothing. Are, are should Panther fans be mad that Chase Young isn't the Panther, or Devontae Adams isn't the Panther, or that some Panthers are still here that they thought might be gone? Well. I put this out on Twitter. I wrote it in a column. I think they were smart not to chase expiring contracts. This is a team that's one in six. Um, Unless you're landing a massive player difference maker, it didn't make a lot of sense, especially when you don't have a first round pick next year. Um, This is, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this franchise. When you go one in six, there are still 10 games left, but do you want to diminish your assets for next year? Uh, when you don't know who the leadership's going to be. Um, you know, obviously there's plenty of time for Fitterer and Reich to to write the ship, but you also want to still make this job very desirable if it doesn't work out. And I think for the Panthers, it was smart to avoid gambling. Gambling's for winners, okay? No. Gambling no. is for winners. And I think for the Panthers, this was a situation where it should have been about adding to their draft nest egg for last for next year, excuse me. Um, they only have six picks, no first round pick. They had some players that that had some interest. Devontae okay. Jackson uh, was a guy I heard had interest, but I guess the price just wasn't to their liking. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we obviously saw some some defensive backs get moved the last couple of weeks. Those guys, those same teams could have maybe been involved with Dante Jackson. Uh, Terrace Marshall got permission to seek a trade. Um, Evidently he did not have the interest or enough interest to make a deal. Brian Burns, uh, they seem to be locked in on not trading him. Uh, And honestly, when you look at the return that Chase Young and and Montez Sweat got for the commanders, you Mm -hmm. say to yourself, well, that makes a ton of sense because this season, Montez Sweat is outperforming uh, Brian Burns, and uh-huh. Chase Young is playing at the same level statistically. So, you know, a second and third round pick individually, you know, what does that tell you about Brian Burns's market? I think right now the smart move for everyone is for, for everybody to take a breath and then readdress the, the negotiations in the offseason because Brian Burns is tied with eight other players for the 21st highest total in sacks this season he's got five sacks there are eight players with eight or more sacks in the league what he's not one of them and so his negotiating power isn't great and i think while he had a lot of leverage with with the rams offer being turned down last year Uh he similarly has less leverage with how the market played out this year i think the the panthers have gained back some leverage here and if i were them i wouldn't want to pay him until i saw what came out of this year i understand he's a locker room leader i understand he's probably their best player but from a negotiation standpoint neither side is really in the best place to get the most out of a deal um you know jeremy chin was a guy who got injured uh i know that there was interest out there before he got placed on ir that's unfortunate sometimes you wait too long to trade a guy and you pay for it uh that's the risk you run but i think Overarch from an overarching standpoint, when you have uncertainty about the future, creating more uncertainty by dealing away long-term cost-controlled assets doesn't make a ton of sense. Also, by the way, had they traded for Chase Young or Montez Sweat, those guys are in the final years of their deals. And oh. They're playing as well as Brian Burns. So then you go from having one pass rusher who you can't see eye to eye with on a contract extension to competing contract extension talks with guys who are playing at an equal level. That is a recipe for disaster. Oh, and by the way, you've got to extend Frankie Lubu. You've got to figure out some, you're you're going to have an extension with Derek Brown down the road. Like, it didn't make a lot of sense. A lot of people wanted wide receivers. The only wide receiver that got dealt yesterday was Donovan Peoples-Jones, and he's kind of a middling third or fourth receiver. Um, You know, 
they did have some interest in wide receivers, but I think they didn't want to make a deal for a guy who was just going to be a part of the group. They want, if they were going to make a deal, it had to be for a notable X receiver. We've talked about it on the show before, you know, that Devonte Adams type. And clearly the Raiders did not want to move him. Um, you know, I don't think Jerry, I kind of agree with Steve Smith on Jerry Judy. I don't think he's a particularly great starting wide receiver to me. Like he's calling him a Jag. I wouldn't call him a Jag, but I think he, I, I, I think that was harsh, but I agree with him. I think he's kind of just a regular oh. starting wide receiver. I mean, he's a guy yeah. who's never had a thousand yard season. Um, you know, he's playing with Russell Wilson while everybody wants to hate on Russell for last year. He's actually playing extremely well right now. And, you know, the truth. and Jerry's not playing particularly well from a statistical standpoint or from an eye test standpoint. Very inconsistent. Cortland Sutton, again, big wide receiver would have been different for this group. I just don't see him being a massive difference maker. Oh, and by the way, both of those guys would be making $13 million next year uh, and have leverage in a, in a negotiation. And I know I'm rambling a little bit here, but like Hunter Redfro, if you watch the game on Monday, like I don't know why anybody would trade for him uh, with that contract. Um you know, I mean, he can't get on the field, and he is pretty redundant when you consider uh, Adam Thielen, and I'm sure Clemson yeah. fans will fill up my inbox, but, like, Hunter Renfro is fine. He's just kind of a redundant guy. They The Panthers have, like, five slot receivers that they're using out of position. So, I mean, to add another <laughs> one doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. I want to rewind you back to something you said at the beginning of that. You said the Panthers want to make sure this is a good job in case – something were to happen with the leadership here. We saw that the, the uh, Las Vegas Raiders move their GM and coach after a 3-5 and five start. Uh, do you think there's a chance the Panthers might move off of Reich and Fitterer this year? Not during the season. I don't, I don't see that. I mean, look, the GM got the first overall pick. I don't think you make that move if you think that this is going to be a short-term project. Um I think Reich handing over play calling duties and holding himself accountable is a big deal. Let's well, see how the next 10 games play out. I mean, if they finish three and 14, then I think, yeah, it's probably likely that at least one of them is not back. Um, excuse me. But I, I think, I think this is going to be a season that's evaluated in, in as a whole. I mean, they didn't really do anything coming out of the bye week other than have Reich turn over play call. Right. Well, well, Most teams well. in that position, at 0-6 at the bye week would do something drastic. They would fire a guy who has a notable name on the coaching staff who otherwise is probably not that important. They would trade a, a, a an underwhelming player who's getting paid a ton of money. They did not do either one of those things. They also doubled down and sat on their hands to quote uh, our, our great producer Drew at the trade deadline. Like, there, this is a situation where I think... Look, the coaching staff wanted DJ Chark. They wanted Miles Sanders. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted Justin Houston. Those guys uh -huh. did not work out. Right. The front office went out and got Hayden Hurst and, um, you know, Von Bell, who have both played kind of substandard. Yeah. You know, uh, David Tepper went out and spent all this money on this coaching staff who were all supposed to be these superior teachers in this great group. At some point, you've got to to take your medicine right like for your yeah. misgivings right like that's that's <clears throat> the reality in life and in football and in all business sometimes you you just have to let it play out and look they won on sunday that was a big deal cj stroud and bryce young are going to be compared together for years well and they well. probably won't play again for another two to three years based on how yeah. the new 17 game scheduling goes right yeah yeah and bryce young outperformed cj stroud that was a huge message for them. Uh, and the rest of this month is of uh, November. Well, I guess it just started now, but well, November is a massive, massive, massive well, month for this. Let, month. Let's talk. Let's talk about that November month. You got the Colts in the 4 p.m. game. So a lot of America is going to see the train wreck or the team is descending one or the other. And then you follow that up, uh, you know, with some winnable games. You got the two and six bears that you, probably really want to beat because you don't want to give them the number one draft pick. And then you got the Cowboys that are playing well, and then you got the Titans. Uh, what do you see for the Panthers in these next group of games? You know, Alex was probably asking, you know, when in the next three, do you see that? And, you know, how do you see the rest of them? Up? 
Well, I didn't think they would beat the Texans, uh, and they just barely made it by, which kudos to them. Um, but I had them, when I did my re, like at the bye, I did a re- prediction or a, a reevaluation of their schedule and I had them going five and twelve and I had them beating Indianapolis without <laughs> Anthony Richardson. I had mm-hmm. them beating the Bears without Justin Fields. Actually but that was prior to Justin Fields getting injured, excuse me. Losing okay. to the Cowboys and then defeating the Titans in Nashville before we knew Will Levis could show off that cannon. Now, let's go through all these games, right? So they're going to play right. Indianapolis this weekend. Yes. You're without Richardson. They've got a really Love good running straight. game. They they have uh, a really good running game, which has been the Panthers' kryptonite, as we know, on defense. No. They can hold firm the way they did against Houston. I'm not expecting that. I think this game could get out of hand in, in the Panthers' favor. Uh, oh. You know, Similarly to what the Panthers have at wide receiver, the Colts really only have Michael Pittman. I mean, Alec Pierce is fine, but it, it, they're struggling to throw the. It, I mean, they're they're not struggling to throw the football, but they're struggling to find inconsistency. They're a high scoring team, but Gardner Minshew has led them to an zero and three stretch because he's so prone to turnovers. In four straight this season, I believe he has turned the ball over nine times, five interceptions, and four fumbles yeah. lost. If this Panthers team can be as opportunistic as they need to be, I think they will play well. You saw this past weekend against the Texans, they changed up their coverage to kind of affect the run game. They'd been like a cover two, cover four team mostly. They played some cover one in this game. That was good. They played some single high. They did, they they evolved a little bit. And I think that's really important. They've got to continue yeah. to do that. Um, I have them beating, I mean, and also we got to remember the underlying storyline, Frank Reich, his former team. You yeah. think he wants to win that game. That's the game ball he wants. Well, last week was a Bryce game. This week is a Frank game. Right. And as we follow that stream of consciousness, the Bears game is the Tepper Fitterer game because they're going to be on national television. They did trade away the first overall pick. Ryan Poles has not done a good job for the Bears, but his lone achievement is getting what he got for the first overall pick. Oh. And DJ Moore, Deontay Foreman have had their moments. They've also kind of shown why the Panthers found both to be pretty inconsistent. I think Deontay Foreman might be the highest variance player in the entire league. When he is good, he is great. When he is bad, it's like, how did he get even on the field? Um, Because, like, look, I saw all the Twitter stuff when he had three touchdowns, but then you look this past week and he's... I tweeted that out too. Yeah, he's averaging less than three yards a carry. I I mean, he, he didn't play particularly well. Um, and he's a guy who needs to be force fed, and that's not really advantageous for an offense. So, you know, DJ Moore has done a really good job. The problem is, is when he doesn't have consistent quarterbacks, his superpowers are diminished. His superpowers are making, uh, you know, off the mark catches, incredible catches, oh. and breaking tackles. And uh-huh. so, if the ball's so off the mark that he can't catch it, well, then he can't break tackles, right? Because you have to break right. the basket. Right. 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 DJ Moore is really. Uh, proven me wrong in a lot of ways. I viewed him as like a top tier number two wide receiver. I think there's only really eight true number ones in the league. Well, now there's nine because DJ Moore has played exponentially well. Uh, Still inconsistent, has his quirks, but I think he is a phenomenal player and he's going to be a phenomenal challenge for this team. I still think the Panthers pull off an upset on the road. I think, you know, we'll talk about him a little bit later, but Bryce Young's starting to look like Bama Bryce. And then you get into the Cowboys. I think the Cowboys are going to smoke. I, I really do. Like, I, I think that's going to be a really tough. Well, it, rolls. it depends on which version of Dak shows up. But yes. Right. But I, I, I think the Dak's going to have a pretty lovely afternoon. That said, there's going to, you know, if David Tepper doesn't like visiting teams, oh man, there's going to be a lot of stars in the. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, the, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm they travel yeah, we'll better than back, anyone. But, well, mostly yeah. because they're all from across the country. And also, the Lakers probably play at night and, and the Yankees are season's over. So, more Cowboys fans to show up. Um, but anyway, uh, and then you go to Nashville and look, I mean, they had interest in Will Levis during the buildup to the draft. I mean, even as far back as last season, I heard about Will Levis and and how much they admired him. And obviously, he fell to the second round, um, played phenomenally against the Atlanta Falcons, an NFC South team, lit them up for four touchdowns. Um, 
And look, I mean, I think it's up to Bryce Young to kind of have some high-powered offense there. Their defense is pretty good. Their offense has been wildly inconsistent. If the, if, if the Panthers' defense can respond and play well and make everybody look good, that's a win for okay, wait, everyone wait, on this. Wait, let, let, me, let me stop you real quick. Okay, so you're saying yeah. that they're, they're, they won the last game. So you're saying there's a good chance they can win three of the next four games. Those are winnable opportunities there. If they split, I still think that's a very big positive. If they go four and one, how does that change the trajectory of things around it? I think it changes them a lot, and that's why I think, like, there's a lot of rush to judgment. Look, I understand the fan base is not happy. They're they're sick of this mediocrity or worse. And, look, I think a lot of people draw in, and fairly, Scott Fitter to Matt Rule. He is the lasting image of, of that swag regime, surfing right? in the locker like, room after a win. Like, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. in Nebraska. Um, but, like, I think that Scott deserves a lot of criticism. I, I do think that he has made some poor choices. A lot of their gambles from this offseason have oh. not worked out on the surface so far. Um, that said, it's very rare to see a team jump to number one from number nine wow. and give up what they gave up knowing that the GM is going to be yep. a short timer, right? Like that's just like you've invested, you've had a plan. Like if you don't follow that through, that's extremely reactionary for better or worse. Um, I also think this, you know, I think David Tepper learned from last time that hiring a head coach and then hiring a GM is not the best move. So if you're going to move on from bitter, you also have to consider moving on from Reich who you've paid a ton of money along with his staff. I think there's a lot of decisions. And remember, being a general manager is not just about pick, making draft picks and making trades. There's a lot that goes into it. You're managing a scouting department. You're managing a coaching staff. You're putting together a coaching uh-huh. staff with a head coach. So I think like it all really depends. This is going to be a big 10-game stretch for Scott Fitter, and his job's largely done for the season. So I, I, I think – I also, you know – I drew the ire of a lot of fans last offseason when I said I didn't think this job was that appealing for a head coach. And we saw, mm-hmm. you know, Ben Johnson drop out of the race. We saw D'Amico Ryan's mm-hmm. not take an interview. Um, they ended up with Steve Wilkes, who did not get a job, and Frank Reich, who interviewed for two jobs. Not to say those guys weren't appealing. Um, I actually think Frank Reich was a logical hire in in the wake of the Matt Rule era. era. Um but I also think you look at what Shane Steichen's doing in Indianapolis. They're one of the top yeah. scoring teams in the league. They drafted a dynamic quarterback um, in Anthony Richardson, who's obviously done for the season with a shoulder cool. injury. So there's that. Um, but a lot of the, you know, Sean Payton, who was also a, a, a retread, got off to a pretty rough start in Denver. Now they're they're playing pretty well. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of thought that needs to go into it. And if you bought into Frank Reich and Scott Fitterer as a tag team enough mm-hmm. to leverage all of those assets and trade up for number one, so you could do something, you know, uh-huh. find that quarterback. I think you have to kind of really be patient. It's it maybe just for this season, but like there's 10 games left. I, I don't think the playoffs are in sight. I never thought this team was going to make the playoffs. Remember, I, I had a yes, we did. and we I got did. into I was, it about I was it. a lot more optimistic. But... <laughs> Listen, if they finish 5-12 and 12 well, or 6-11, and 11, I think everybody's back. At least from a big point, yeah. overarching yeah. stand. I mean, I think there will be changes to the coaching staff. Obviously, uh, Ejero Everett. Evero is is a guy who's going to be viewed as a prime head coaching candidate. I think he did a phenomenal job on Sunday. Um, and so we'll see how it goes. But, I mean, look, this is a team that flipped over half of its roster. It, it kept all but three. I mean, it kept three coaches from the previous staff. Otherwise, mm-hmm. everybody's different. Um, they have a new defensive scheme. Uh, they have two coordinators who are very young and new well, to doing what they do. I mean, Evero only has one year coordinator experience. Thomas mm-hmm. Brown just called his first game. Like there's a lot of change here. And, you know, people don't like the word rebuild. You can call it a retooling, a building, whatever. I mean, you can call it but, Looney Tunes if you want. Like I, I like, let's call it what it is. This team was getting flipped over. It's well, a philosophy change. And look, yeah. the division's terrible. They are terrible. This is the worst division in football. It's no question about it. But this team also overachieved significantly 
with Steve Wilkes, and that's a credit to Steve Wilkes. They were not a good team last year, and so the expectations were wow. high after winning seven games. This was a five-win team last year. They won seven games. And so I think if they can kind of rebound and say, you know, hey, they've changed all this stuff. There's rationale there. Fans might not like it, but I, I understand why well, Tepper is being patient here. I mean, we'll see. Let's, I mean, one thing that could change the equation is that number one draft pick starts playing like the number one draft pick. And Sunday, he looked a lot more, to your point, like Bama Bryce. He was making those off-schedule plays, uh, scrambling. There was one play where he went right, came back left, hit uh, – Adam Thielen over the top. Thielen made a great catch. That was more what, you know, we saw out of Bryce in, in Alabama. Was that the play calling, or was that him, him just getting more comfortable? Well, I think during the bye week, a lot of things needed to be said. I think when you have a new play caller and he's in your ear and he says, hey, well, don't be afraid to go make a play and bail right. me out and make me look good. I think that's what he said, but that sometimes does happen in my experience. Uh, and covering the league, sometimes a pep talk can kind of get you out of, out of your overthinking. I think they've done a really good job of of limiting communication to make it more productive and more efficient. I think that Bryce's head's not swimming. I think I, I don't think like I think it's unfair to say that they've simplified the offense, but I think they've simplified the language, and I think that that's really important. Um. You know, instead of having a long sentence to read out mm -hmm. of like random words, maybe it's a couple of words. Mm -hmm. And that's really good. That's a good one, right? They talk about it all the time in our profession. If you can if you can write tight, you mm -hmm. can write. You know what I mean? And so I think that's really appealing for Bryce. I think he's able to think out there. He's not mm -hmm. overthinking the play. Um, I think he knows what this team is. He knows who he trusts. Uh, very clearly Adam Thielen. What I was most impressed by, though, is we saw brutal, brutal drops by Jonathan Mingo and DJ Chark in the first half, and Bryce still went back to them and got big plays out of them. That is that is veteran leadership. That is smart quarterbacking. And frankly, it's... I mean, it's a, it's a really appealing growth standpoint for a rookie quarterback and I think if you were the Panthers you feel really good about Bryce Young moving forward I, 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 look he needs to make off skill off schedule plays Josh yeah. can call it his superpower yeah. and that's what it is well Mike I gotta ask you about uh Tommy Trimble and Chuba Hubbard are playing and Hayden Hurst and Miles Sanders aren't playing as much so we thought that situation would be flip-flop is that surprising no, not at all. I think when when you're playing the amount of 11 personnel that this team's playing, and now that they're running a little bit more power uh, because of Bradley Bozeman's limitations, I, I, I think that Chuba Hubbard's the right guy to run north to south. I think Tommy Tremble, when you play 11 personnel at tight end, you have to be able to block, and he is far the superior blocker well, to Hayden Hurst. He's also proven to be a playmaker as well, and I think those are two guys. They're very close friends. They're both 2021 draft picks. They've worked really hard. When we were at Wofford, they were on the jugs machine 30 minutes after practice. Like, this is that the teammates have really appreciated their work ethic. I think the coaching staff has as well. And frankly, Hayden Hurst has played horribly uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, Miles Sanders has gotten off to a really rough start, and they need to get production while they can. I mean, this is, this is a big boy league, a lot of people are getting paid. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I actually credit the coaching staff for, and, and front office for going with the guys who are Matt Rule holdovers, who are on rookie contracts instead of the guys that they really paid pretty mm -hmm. substantial money to. And I think they're letting performance speak for itself. And I think there's a lot of young guys on this team on the depth chart that are going to be inspired by that. Well, we've talked to you so long. We know you had a lot on your mind, but I know there's some more you have on your mind. So we're going to go to my favorite part of the show, Case Takes. Tom Brown's the most impressive person on this entire in this entire organization right now. Uh, I I can't I can't overstate how impressed I was with how he called that final drive against the Texans. I mean he he was balanced, he was smart, he took yardage when he could. Um, yeah, where there's some some blips, especially that uh, fourth down play early on in the game. Sure. But he was feeling it out. I think when you watch his press conferences, I could listen to that guy talk football for the rest of my life. Uh, he's just a really impressive guy. 
And I know a lot was made out of Evero, a lot was made out of Jim Caldwell and, and Dom Capers and Josh McCown and all those guys. I think Thomas Brown is a guy who talks, carries himself like a future head coach. Um, clearly, he's all in on Bryce. I appreciate the way he explains his thought process. I love the the no block, no rock. Uh, some might think that's a little corny, but I, I think uh, it's actually a really great way of simplifying communication, right? Like that was the whole thing we just talked about with Bryce. And I think when you look at Thomas Brown's upside, it's genuinely intriguing for this team because Frank Reich ripped the mandate off. He gave the play calling to Thomas Brown. You could see how emotionally invested Frank Reich is in Thomas Brown. When you watch the post game, uh, game ball ceremony or whatever in the locker room, when you talk to him in a press conference, Thomas Brown is going to be set up to succeed. I think the Panthers have set him up to succeed. And I think a lot like Bryce Young, he's going to learn on the job and and try to grow gradually week to week. Well, all right. Well, Mike, thanks for coming on with us. I love Mike. Uh, K takes the end of the show every week. And no matter where you're listening to us, mm -hmm. uh, like, follow, subscribe. Uh, you can also do word of mouth. We're on every podcast platform you can you can find so if you want to download mike and hear his takes in the car please do as well and we'll be back next week with another episode of processing blue